If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Acts, please? In chapter 27, beginning in verse 17. Or verse 13. The eyes are going to. The mind has gone a long time ago. Beginning in reading in verse 13, Acts chapter 27. And when the south wind blew uh, softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlan. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. And when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. And fearing lest they should fall into quicksands, they strake or lowered the sail and were driven. And we being a seating tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not to have loosed from Crete and to have gained this great harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there should be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, and that it shall be even as he has. Uh, even as I was told. Paul was on his way to Rome to be tried before Caesar for the, for the outlandish law, uh, crime of preaching Christ. He was in the Mediterranean at this particular point in a ship, and they were in trouble. It was late in the fall, and they were sailing against better judgment because the days were like this. You know some of those Indian summer days. And they thought, we can make it the rest of the way to Italy. At least one of the islands where it'd be safe to winter. But as they sailed, they were caught in a storm that came that wouldn't let up. And it was such a storm that they had to throw the tackling of the ship and finally all the wares of the ship and all the goods that they were carrying. And they thought that all was lost. They thought it was too late. Well, Christians today face storms. Amen? amen. If I say my own amen, it takes longer, folks. But uh, you know some of the waves that come against you. Some of the things that just seem like you can't get through, you can't get over, you can't get around even. But then God makes a way. And even being a Christian doesn't exempt us from problems. It means that God goes with us through these problems. And when we learn a lesson or two, God will say, all right, to the wind, and it, begin, it stops blowing, and the waves become calm. And we go to the other side and we say, thank you, Lord Jesus, thank you. But maybe you're faced right now with a great bank of waves that are coming at you. What do you do? What, what can you do? Well, you do what Paul did. And what, they, uh, what he exhorts us to do, too. In verses 18 and 19, it says, And being exceeding tossed with tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Christians today are carrying too big a load. Now, I don't mean just working too hard. But our life is so hectic. We've got such a schedule. And we're lugging along a few things we ought not to be lugging along. And that's what it's talking about. And if we want to get safely to the other shore, in other words, without being shipwrecked, we better loosen up a little bit, folks. 
We better realize that we can't carry the whole uh, world on our shoulders, nor can we lug along a lot of extra trinkets and trash that we don't really need. And we better get back to basic first century Christianity and let the Lord take care of things. What are you talking about, John? Come with me back to the book of, of uh, 2 Corinthians for just a moment. 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. And some of it, maybe you think, well, how does this apply? But some of it, the Lord just may go smash right into our face with something that we should be doing and something we should not be doing. Be not equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So far, basically, what we have read is just this. Christians, for example, should marry Christians. Christians should be in business with Christians. I don't mean working for, but I mean uh, there are instances where Christians and non-Christians have formed a business and it just has not worked out. Because the Christian would say, for example, there are certain things that is against my religion. I don't really want to do. I don't want to work on Sunday, for example. I want to go to church. That's the Lord's Day. And yet the unsaved person says, well, we need to do these things. Or maybe you've gone into some type of food service and uh, the Christian says, I don't want to get a liquor license. And the unsaved might say, but that's the only way we're going to make money and stay in business. And what do you do? You see, there's a real problem there. And when two, Christ or when two kids get married, one's a Christian and one is not a Christian, there's going to be problems because you have different father-in-laws. The Christian has the, the fa or different fathers. Uh, the father of the Christian is God, and the father of the unsaved is the devil, old smutty face himself. And there's going to be tensions. There's going to be problems in that type of relationship. And so take these things into mind. But there are a lot of other things, too, that it's talking about. It says in verse 17, Wherefore, come off from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. There are certain things, you know, that may be all right for you to do, but it's a bad testimony for you to do. And so you ought not to do those things, you know. There are certain places that you ought not to go. There are certain things that you ought not to say, certain language that you should not use. And you need to be careful here, and we need to realize that we're a new creation in Christ, that we have been bought with a price. We belong to God. You say, but I want to do my own thing. Oh, God is very gracious and good. And for the most part, if it's not sinful, God will let you do it. God will let you have a lot of toys and do a lot of things. For example, maybe you have a new boat. Maybe somebody, maybe a Christian gets a new boat. And you say, wow, the only chance I'm going to get is to go out there on Sunday morning and just stay in it all week. Well, you better reconsider some of these things. Or skiing with the winter coming on. They tell us it's going to be a hard winter. I don't know. But, uh, but you know, I mean, wow, that ski lodge just calls, you know. And so many other things that we need to just reconsider. Because we're king's kids. We belong to God. And we should make decisions about what we do and where we go and who, you know, the different things. What would Jesus do? You remember the bracelets? What would Jesus do, bracelets? And we need to reconsider this whole thing because we have gotten too far away from dead center in walking with God. And that's what this is talking about. And he said, if you will do these things, I'll receive you. And in verse 18, will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Almighty. Now, you're saved. All right. But what it's saying here is, I'll be able to have fellowship as a father with you. And that beats anything else and any fun that we could have. We need to begin to put Jesus first and ask, Lord, what would you have me to do? I get into chapter 7 and verse 1. Therefore, or having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Old-fashioned Christian separation needs to be practiced by Christians. You say, I don't want to be in a box. Whoever said you could have to be in a box. Jesus said, come unto me, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pastors. You can have more fun, more joy being a Christian than you used to have before you became a Christian. You know that. I don't have to explain it to you. You know that. But you're taking away all the fun. Have you ever come across a, a son or a daughter who would say, I was just raised in a strict environment and I'm getting out of here. How would you like to be raised down in Amishville? I mean, some of the kids get out of it, but they're shut if they do. And it's very, very hard to get out of that. But Christian kids seem to have the idea, I can get out of here. Or sometimes a father or mother say, I was raised in this strict environment. Church twice on Sunday and once, once during the week. And I'm not going to jam this down my kid's throat. No, it's all right. Go ahead and send them to hell if you want to. But that's a price that you're going to have to pay. I come back to the text itself. Are you sinking? Maybe it's time to get rid of some excess baggage. Maybe it's time to, to uh, get close to God. He said the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, that when we partake of communion, we're to do it in a worthy manner. In other words, we're, come, we're to come before God with hearts that are clean and hands that are clean and attitudes that are right. Because he said, if you don't, some folks get sick and some folks have even died. God can take a person home if they're not living a good life. Now, we don't see a lot of that today, but I'll tell you, it pays to walk the straight and narrow as far as your health is concerned, too. Well, let's go on. In verses 20 through 22, not only did he get rid of excess baggage on the ship, but also he got alone with God. And this is tremendously important. But going back to that first point, I want to add this at least. It says in Psalm 139, in verses 23 and 24, it just says that, that these words, cleanse me, O God, search me, O God, try me, O God, see if there be anything in my life that's wickedness, take, <coughs> excuse me, and take it away. And we need to make a list, things that maybe grieve the Holy Spirit and say, God, I'm not going to do it anymore. Lord, take some spiritual soap to my mouth. And my attitudes, God, my attitudes, my thoughts. Lord, cleanse me, oh God. I want to be your man. I want to be your woman. But I come down to verses 20 through 22, it's in, uh, especially in verse 20. But long, after long abstinence, what's he talking about here? Paul had been praying and fasting. And, of course, everybody on ship was fasting. They wanted to see if they could finally get through to God and get through this storm. Our only hope as Christians today is prayer. Our only hope, because we live in a world that's getting darker and darker, and in a country that's going the wrong direction. I'm not talking only politically, but I'm talking now spiritually as well. We have shoved God out of every part of the life except the church. And I've told you before, I don't intend to take any more weddings. Number one, I'm an old man and they take too much out of me. And secondly, same-sex marriage has already been approved in Michigan. It's just that our good governor has put the lid on. But when that comes... When he takes the lid off and when, it, when it, preachers have to. And if they refuse, before long they can be fined. Because, for example, 
florists can be made, directed by law. You've got to work with these, these two of the same sex in the marriage. And bakers the same way. Baking a cake. Now, if I, were bake, if I were a baker and baking the cake for that type of situation, I'd bake x lax into it. But, but uh, uh, preachers can be fired and can be jailed. I'm too old to go to jail, you know. So I'm just going to say I can't do it. My granddaughter came up to me yesterday and said, you mean you're not going to marry me a year from now? I said, honey, I can't. And I told her why. I didn't really want to anyway because I'd rather, I'd rather work on a funeral for someone like old John than uh, any, any wedding, like this one yesterday. Uh, good kids, but just kids, you know what it is. But our only hope is prayer. Jesus faced with crucifixion. That's why he came into the world. But the thought of his holy soul being tainted with my sin and yours and the sin of the whole world so he could pay the price in the shedding of his blood there on the tree got to him. And there in the garden of Gethsemane he prayed, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Father, take this cup away from me. What? The suffering? No, he could have suffered on that cross from then till now and for all eternity. He was human, but he was God. But the thought of his soul being touched with sin of any kind, it just broke his heart. And on the cross crying out, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father had to turn his face on his son because it just made him want to throw up. His son was obnoxious to him because of my sins. But he paid the price and finally said, it is finished, and gave up the ghost and died. And like the Bible says, he died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And thank God, he's in heaven today, and he's able to forgive all our sins. But folks, we waller in mud. We just continue to carry garbage in our minds, and in our lives, instead of saying, Lord, yeah, this looks good and that looks good, but I know it's not for me. Lord, I'm your man, I'm your woman. But we've got to remember, one of these days, it's all going to close out. The ledger is going to be closed of our life. And we'll have to stand before God. Come down to verse 23. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Therefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as he told me. Isn't that amazing? Here was this storm. They couldn't even tell where they were. If they went to the North Africa coast, they might be swallowed up with the quicksands that were there. If they went into one of the islands, they might have broken that ship up and all of them been killed. They were just floating around at the pleasure of the winds and then almost being swamped. What could they do? What could they do? But Paul had prayed and Paul was a man of prayer. And prayer still works. It's the most power, powerful thing in the whole universe. A Christian in prayer. But Paul said, fear not, men. Now, Paul had fears too. There are sometimes, I mean, when the doctor says you've got cancer or one of your family members has cancer, fear strikes you. I have a 53-year-old nephew down in Texas. And he was just told that he had lymphoma or cancer. How long he has, I don't know. And that's a fearful thing. It just broke his wife and kids up. And my brother has been down once and he's going back down from Nashville again just to be with the family. It's a fearful thing. A terribly fearful thing. And you remember when Jack Ruddy was told that he had brain cancer. 
and how we gathered around him in the house across the road in our house and prayed, anointing him with oil. Brain cancer is very seldom healed. It usually takes a person within a short time. And God took him home. These things are fearful things when it hits one of our family members. Maybe we could take almost anything, right? But to see our wife suffer or to see our children or our grandchildren suffer, it's a hard thing. But it's something that happens in the world. And Christians are not exempt from this. Thank God that there's an ocean between us and Ebola. Yet it's coming into the United States one by one. And what will it be? If I weren't such an old man, I need to go back to Africa just to hold the hands of these preachers that are ministering in those 10 Newburgh Norton churches over in, in uh, Ghana, West Africa. But everybody says, no matter your age, don't go to Africa at this time. And I understand this. I understand this. But he said, fear not. He knew who, he knew who was in charge. If God wants to take me home now, that's up to you, God, is what he was saying. Not very many of us are like old harmonica John. Said again just last week, I wish God would take me home. I'm ready. And he was. And I don't know if it was a stupid statement or not and whether the whole family got mad at me or not, but I said, old John, wasn't the sharp there at the funeral. Old John wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. But he's smarter than a lot of you because he knew where he was going. He was ready to go to heaven. And you aren't prepared. Yeah. And you know, folks, Paul was a man of prayer. Paul knew where he was going. Not only was his life saved, but so were the lives of all the rest of them on the ship. God help us. Not only to be sure ourselves, but to be right with God and take others with us into glory. I came by a field of corn today that must be an old man planted it, an old planter, because the rows were about that far apart. I didn't think anybody in Michigan planted that way anymore. But you could almost walk through those rows, you know. But... God has given us two arms, and we can take at least two more people with us, you know, and we ought to, because that's a God-given privilege. He said, I believe God, in verse 25, do you? No matter what happens, you still say, I believe God will see me through. I don't know why this has happened to me, but I believe God. I believe God. Folks, we got to get back and live at the foot of the cross. we got to get back with our faces headed toward heaven. We've got to get back to lives that are lived for God's glory, not just for our pleasure. Do you have faith and confidence in God no matter, no matter what might come? The psalmist is told, or in Exodus, I'm sorry, they were ready to cross the Red Sea, the children of Israel, the, the parents too, but there they stood at the Red Sea right before them. That wide mass of water coming behind them with the whole Egyptian army ready to get them and take them back into slavery and kill those who resisted. And they were crying out to Moses, help! The words were this. God's words to Moses and then Moses to them. Stand still. Don't be afraid, in other words. Stand still, fear not. Why? Why? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I don't know what's ahead for any one of you or for me. But I know who is, who is ahead and who is our guide and our leader. And I claim with the Apostle Paul, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed in, unto him against that day. Amen. Praise God for this book. And I believe it. But today, we need to come to that place of total commitment to Jesus Christ. 
Are you safe in the arms of Jesus? Maybe the storm's just hitting you full force this last week. Whew. I don't know what happened, whether well, it was another straight liner or what, but it just came right over for about five minutes, ten minutes maybe, and I thought it was going to take the church and the house and everything else. And I thought that area of Betty's, that's a wind tunnel, I thought that would be a mess again, but it wasn't. But sometimes the old storms come against us. Safe in the arms of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you called us one day and drew us to yourself. I thank you, Father, for all that you have done and seen us through in these years. And someone here might be going through deep waters. Help them, dear God. Help them to look up. Help them like Peter when he began to sink as he was walking on the water because he lost his faith to cry out, Lord, save me. And we know that you'll reach down. We pray, too, that if there's one person here who's not sure that they're ready to stand before you, that today, right now, where they are, in silent prayer, they'd say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior now. Dismiss us with your blessing, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen.